recording. I'm Eleanor and welcome to ICC Austria's Trade Finance Week 2020, the COVID-19 edition. As a golden rule, we often say that letters of credit do not deal in contracts, but in documents, which is basically another way of describing the independent principle that rules trade finance instruments such as demand guarantees or letters of credit. However, some of the documents, for example, transport documents, such as the bill of lading, a beneficiary needs to present are directly linked and a direct result of the underlying contractual relations. To allocate costs, risks and tasks, of a transport in an international commercial transaction, parties more often than not rely on the ICC Ecoterm rules, which have been recently updated. Today, we have invited two expert speakers to join us and explain to us the new updates and what is new, as well as how to use the Ecoterms so that your letter of credit will work. Please welcome with me Hugo Forshore, who after more than 30 years with ING has recently gone independent, as well as the famous or infamous Bob Ronnie from Australia who wears many hats. Today he will wear his hat as a member of the drafting group of the new Incoterms. Having said all of this, the show is ready to start. And with that, Hugo, the screen is yours. Thank you, Leo. That's the third time I hear you saying that this week, so no problem. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, all over the globe. We have a very international audience and a, and a very international set of speakers as well. Together with Bob Brunei, Bob Brunei is in Australia, and you can't see him, but I can see him, and he already put on his pajamas, because right after this webinar, he will go to sleep. It's in the middle of the night in Australia now. Okay, um, what are we going to do um, uh, during this webinar? Inco terms and letters of credit. How do, do both of them interact? I hear you saying, well, Inco terms and letters of credit, they're two se separate things. If you are the buyer or the issuing bank or the beneficiary or a conferring bank, whatever party you are in the letter of credit, what are the documents that should be requested in the uh, frame of a letter of credit? So what documents should be requested in a letter of credit? First of all, the documents that are under control of the seller, of the beneficiary. The beneficiary should be under control. I mean, he can draw up his invoice and he can get transport documents if the carrier acts on instructions of the seller of the beneficiary because otherwise it's out of his hands. What documents, what other documents should be requested? Well, documents, the buyer needs to take delivery of the goods and the buyer needs to fulfill, fulfill other obligations such as clearance of the goods, import, duty regulations, etc. These all can be documents requested under letter of credit. And also the requirements of a documentary credit should also follow the logic of the trade terms that are uh, and the trade terms that are used in a sales contract. For example, it is not logic, as we will see later on, to request for a bill of lading, an airway bill, or a transport document, and issue a letter of credit with an ex-works contract. The same goes with the D terms. <clears throat> with the D terms where the uh, the delivery is made at buyer's site, you cannot as a uh, uh, well you can have as a beneficiary you can have the documents, but who will need the documents? We'll get to that later. If you have a look at free carrier and FOB free on board and freight prepaid, is that logic? Or freight collect with CPT and uh, CFR? Is that correct? We see many illogical things in some letters of credit. 
some banks do uh, do offer logical checks in their platforms used by clients to apply for the issues of a letter of credit so if you then request for a bill of lading uh, with an, an FOB terms and freight prepaid, the system will warn you, is that correct? That is all v already uh, going very far, but it sh uh, it, it's a good solution. If Incoterms rules foresee arrangement of transfer by the buyer, like it is the case with free carrier, free alongside ship or free on board, well, the seller is not the shipper. As far as letter of credit is concerned, that's not a problem because there's a there's one of the articles that says that the, sh the shipper on a bill of lading should not be the beneficiary. But will the seller be able to obtain an onboard bill of lading in case of free carrier or free alongside ship where he does not deliver the goods on board? What if the buyer is not able or willing to arrange for transport? Suppose he went bankrupt, he will not arrange for transportation and you will be stuck with your merchandise as a seller. Your merchandise will be stuck in the part, you will not be able to deliver them. Deviations are foreseen in FCA, FAS and FOB, see uh, uh, articles A4 of these Incoterms rules, uh, to cater for this, but they're possibly rather awkward. Well, will the buyer always be aware of the problem and instruct the seller to take care of the transport, perhaps? I got the impression that most buyers do not understand, well, why do you want to take care of transport? Because it's my task to do this. And will the buyer be able to pay charges and expenses? And that's where the problem starts. Because if uh, you as a seller say, well, mm -hmm, uh, perhaps I don't know, I don't trust my buyer entirely, he might be in a bad shape, I'll take care of transport myself. Well, you will see that many forwarders or carriers will know this as well, especially when your buyer is a well-known counterpart. He will say, well, I'm not delivering or I'm not transporting goods on a freight collect or a freight payable destination. Uh, uh, based because I'm not quite sure whether I will receive uh, my fr uh, my freight charges at destination. An onboard bill of lading. In principle, you should have an onboard bill of lading uh, unless the credit says otherwise, but I haven't seen that much credit which, which, uh, uh, which cater for a received for shipment bill of lading. In principle, only the seller's obligation with FOB, CFR and CIF. With free on board uh, and CFR, CIF, the place of delivery is indeed on board of the vessel. Inco Terms 2020 also foresee an onboard bill of lading with free carrier to cater for this problem. See, uh, 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 see uh, articles A6 and B6. But it's a bit awkward. And certainly what we see with container shipment, free carrier, CPT and CIP are more appropriate because there the delivery is not on board. You, <clears throat> the delivery is made when you hand over the goods to the carrier. Uh, many letters of credit stipulate container shipment and free on board CFR and CIF. This is problematic, I know. And I know of many banks that have tried because the problem uh, uh, arose for the first time with the introduction of Inco Terms 2010. I know of many banks who have requested banks on the other side, well, please, can you change this? Because it, uh, with a container FOB is not possible. That the other bank, the banks or the buyers on the other side uh, asked, well, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. You cannot deliver as a seller, you cannot deliver a container on board. The best thing you can do is deliver a container at a container freight station or a container yards in the hands of the carrier. And it's the carrier who will, um, it's, the, it's the carrier who will uh, uh, put the container on board. So you will not be able under normal circumstances to have an onboard bill of lading. What we see is that in a lot of cases, people try to find a solution and the carrier says, okay, I will give you a receipt for shipment bill of lading. And where the container is effectively on board, I will add an onboard notation that, or I will give you an onboard bill of lading. But this is no guarantee. Your delivery is when the container is handed over to the carrier, nothing less, but nothing more. Insurance documents. Insurance documents are only appropriate with CIP and CIF. Uh, 
<clears throat> where the insurance is to be taken care of by the seller. Requirement for an insurance document with other Incoterms rules is perhaps a drafting mistake. If you see a letter of credit with an FOB delivery term and uh, requesting an insurance document, well, this is probably a drafting mistake. On the other hand, no request for an insurance document with CIP and CIF is probably a drafting mistake as well. And remember, there's a possible conflict between CIF Article A5 and UCP Article 28H. I'll tell you why. Um, most letters of credit will require an all-risk coverage or describe it in such a way that it boils down to an all-risk. Well, under CIF, Cost Insurance and Freight, the, uh, the minimum insurance to be taken care of by the seller is Institute Cargo Clauses C. Well, this may be insufficient for the normal Incoterms rule CIF, which, uh, uh, which re only requested C, and your letter of credit will say all risks only. Institute cargo clauses A will cover this all risks. Check. When you receive letters of credit, dear beneficiaries or dear confirming or advising bank check your letters of credit i always say if you receive a letter of credit please read it from the left hand to the right bottom the reverse side and even the edge if there's something written on it and you will see a lot of letters of credit mentioning fob skip hall airport fob uh, beijing airport fob with air freight this is not a genuine Incoterms 2010 rule. I know, and then people are requesting banks on the other side, please can you change it because FOB is only suitable for maritime transport. I know that on the other side, a lot of people will say, mm, I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Because they don't know the Incoterms rules. How is the reference made to sales terms in the letter of credit? Just C and F is not a valid mention under INCO terms 2020. CFR plus a place plus INCO terms 2020. That is the only valid way in the letter of credit to, uh, to <coughs> in the letter of credit to refer to INCO terms. Banks, you should have a look at your application forms or your systems that your customers are using for issuing or uh, requesting issuance of letters of credit. Should you really mention a version of INCO terms? I mean, I know of banks that since the 1st of January 2020, they mention in their standard application forms INCO terms 2020. Well, you're not obligated to use INCO terms 2020. You can still have contracts under ECO terms 2010. And if parties want to use INCO terms 2000, well, who cares? They have the right to do so. So perhaps my advice would be do not mention any INCO terms rule at all and leave it open for buyer and seller to have their input and leave it open for the buyer to tell you, well, this should be INCO terms 2020 or this should be something completely else. They have the right to do so. But if your customer requests you, what should I use? Well, of course you can say, well, the best thing you can do is use your INCO terms 2020 rules. Why? Because then it's standardized. Everybody knows what you're talking about if you're telling FOB. The rules and INCO terms. Well, UCP 600 is silent about INCO terms. Read UCP 600. There's nothing in there. And I even hear people say, I don't have to know this because there's Article 14a that says you have to check for conformity on basis of the documents alone. Well, I know of a, uh, of a certain good friend of mine, Don Smith in the US, during one of the last trade finance weeks of RCC Austria, he had an item, what a document checker should know. Well, knowing INCO terms rules is on top of that list. As a document checker, you should know what INCO terms are about. Otherwise, you will not be able to check documents, I'm afraid. The only reference in letters of credit rules you can see is when a trade term is in, in sorry is in ISBP seven four five 
paragraph C8, which is when a trade term is stated as part of the goods description in the credit, an invoice is to indicate that trade term. And when the source of the trade term is stated, the same source is to be indicated. And then the, the, the ISBP gives an example. If, for example, a trade term uh, in a credit as CIF Inco terms 2010 is not to be indicated on an invoice as CIF Singapore or CIF Singapore Inco terms, no, it should be CIF Inco terms 2010. However, when a trade term is stated in the credit as CIF Singapore, well, it may also be indicated on an invoice as CIF Singapore Inco terms 2010 or any other revision, 2020, for example. The ISVP date from before 2020. Can I have the next slide, please? And then uh, Bob will have to talk because Bob, I'm going to ask you um, if you see X works in a letter of credit, can you please tell me why this is not working? Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Great to be here. Well, I'm here and you're there, but you know what I mean. X works and letters of credit. Wow. In X works, the seller has no obligation to do anything apart from making the goods available to the buyer to collect. There is no transport document. And in fact, there is no or well, very little delay between delivery, the seller making the goods available to the buyer and when the buyer actually takes hold of the goods. How does that satisfy you there, Hugo? Yeah, and um, but but suppose I want, as a buyer, I want evidence that the delivery has been made by the seller. How could I do this? What is the, the proof of delivery here with XWorks? The seller's obligation is also to give notification to the buyer that he has or it has delivered, that is, put the goods at the disposal of the buyer. That's it. So the evidence for a letter of credit would be merely a copy or photocopy of the email or other notification. That's it. The transaction does not refer to the goods being taken hold of physically by the buyer, merely being made available by the seller. Exactly, indeed. How would this work with free carrier CPT or CIP? Uh, slightly different problems, but somewhat the same. In FCA, the seller has two options. Either A, to put the goods on the carrier's uh, collecting vehicle, which may well be packing them into a container, or B, the seller themselves delivering the goods to another party, which would typically be the buyer's carrier, and the goods are not unloaded from the truck. So when that seller's truck arrives into the container yard or container freight station, then they have delivered even before the buyer's carrier removes the goods from the truck. However, there is no obligation on the seller to do anything beyond that point. They have no idea when the goods, especially if it's LCL, will be packed into a container or possibly even what vessel those goods will go on. They will normally never see a bill of lading. Which brings us to B6. Uh, if you like, I'll talk about that one, Hugo. Yeah, sure. Please do. Okay, B6 was an attempt to clarify the issue uh, because I'd pointed out in the drafting group uh, discussions that sellers require a bill of lading, an onboard bill of lading, to work simply with a letter of credit. So this came up as a suggestion, it was an idea and it ran. Um, it has many problems though, because yes, the buyer, if agreed in the contract and anything at all can be agreed in the contract because the seller and buyer always have freedom of contract. 
but if agreed in the contract, then the buyer must instruct its carrier to issue an onboard bill of lading to the seller. Okay, logically, that onboard bill of lading can only be issued after the goods are on board. Now, this may well be after the last day of delivery in the contract. Remember what I just explained about delivery. So the seller has no control over when it's going on a ship or even if it is going on a ship or, or does go on the ship. Also, there is no contract between the seller and the buyer's carrier. So that buyer's carrier, while it may fulfill the buyer's instruction, has no obligation to the seller, for example, to modify their bill of lading to suit the letter of credit. They can say to the seller, I don't take instructions from you. And lastly, oh, that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the famous thing, all documents should mention letter of credit number and the carrier oh, refuses to yes, put it on. Yeah. And all of that nonsense. Or the worst yeah. one, you know, the freight forwarders who insist on issuing their bills of lading uh, on their own letterhead as agent for the carrier and failing to nominate a carrier, which they are not an agent for anyway, they are the carrier. But um, the other problem then that arises is what happens if the carrier simply does not issue, no, well, we'll go one step earlier. What happens if the carrier decides not to issue the bill of lading until the buyer pays the freight? And then lastly, what happens if the carrier simply doesn't issue the seller with a bill of lading? There is no remedy for the seller. He goes to the buyer and says, your carrier didn't give me a bill of lading. Buyer says, well, I did what I contracted to do. And I, I said I would instruct the carrier. What can I do? It's not a solution. <laughs> CPT and CIP, very quickly, the seller gives the goods or delivers the goods to its carrier. There is no obligation in the rules as to what happens beyond that date of delivery, the physical handing over of the goods, whether it's three days or three weeks that the goods might go on board a vessel is not in the, it's not an obligation in the ego terms rules. Yep. And indeed in coming back to the, to the FCA uh, where the shipping company says, well, I'm not going to deliver a bill of lading to the freight charge I've been paid in these times of increased commercial risk and increased country risk. Well, this should be a warning light. Mm -hmm. yeah. FCA, CPT and CIP, are not really compatible with letters of credit. Yeah, but you see it a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, not as many as you would see if they be CFR and CIF sure. for containers. Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. Uh, DAP, DPU, DDP delivered at place, delivered, uh, uh, delivered, uh, uh, unloaded and delivered duty paid. Well, what is that? I mean, I see letters of credit using the D terms. Well, why can't I do this? It's very convenient. I control as a seller. I control everything. I pull the strings. I'm responsible for delivering the goods until the final place of destination. What is the problem then? Or almost the final place of destination. That's what I want, isn't it? Yes. But if you were to ask my advice is run a mile from the D rules. The D rules started out really as an intra-Europe concept. Great for road transport, wonderful. But the moment you go cross ocean transport, they tend to have problems. So let's look at DAP, delivered at place. Now, the Inco terms rules are remarkably silent on what that place might be. And I've just finished drafting up the revision for the ICC of the ICC Guide on Transport and the Inco Terms 2020 rules. And I changed the process. I have actually gone through and defined delivery in all the rules. And when I got to the D rules, it got uh, crazy. Because you then have to look at all the, mo the different modes of transport at the other end. So it could be road, it could be rail, in road, it's likely to be right to door to the buyer's premises. In rail, it could be to a station or terminal or to the buyer's premises if they have a rail siding, or we'll come back to it in a moment, somebody did something. Um, FCLs, 
LCLs, break bulk and bulk, and air freight. Everything's different. But potentially in all the D rules, you have actually two places, two options of delivery, a little bit like FCA had, but the D rules are silent about it. One option is a terminal. And the other option is another place beyond the terminal, typically the buyer's premises. A terminal kind of works, depending. And the buyer's premises means that once the buyer has import cleared in DAP or DPU, the seller then once again has to take control of the goods from that terminal in the destination country and have their carrier transport the goods to the buyer's premises. Now, this has problems. Um, apart from an LC point of view, it has problems because you can't really use DAP for air freight or LCL. DAP is not unloaded from the arriving means of transport. If you have DAP CFS or terminal or airport, um, and guess what? They've been unloaded from the container. If yeah. it's an LCL, yeah. they've otherwise, been unloaded other, from the aircraft. Yeah. Otherwise, the aircraft would have to wait until the buyer comes in and loads Exactly. Yeah. Not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Um, a DPU, oh, wow. Um, I don't like DPU at all. DPU is an extension of DAT, which in itself was well-intentioned but ill-conceived extension of, uh, of delivered X key. Um, DPU, you cannot deliver an FCL DPU into a container yard because DPU is the goods unloaded and the goods will not be unloaded in a container yard. The buyer will take the goods in the container. So you, that would be DAP. Um, D, DPU, of course, works at a terminal for LCL or for air freight because the goods are unloaded and would work for rail if the goods are unloaded from a rail car into a station. DDP, please don't use it. Yep. The same as XWorks, please don't use it. Um, there was much pressure on the drafting group to delete them but basically they are the bookends. They are the two that you should not use and we left them in with stronger warnings not to use them. DDP yeah. requires the seller to import clear the goods and again has those two places of delivery. I should mention in DPU, by the way, consider this. If you were selling DPU buyer's premises in an FCL, not only would your carrier have to collect the container once the buyer has import cleared them and take the, the container to the buyer's premises, then your carrier also has to provide labor and equipment to unload that container, the goods from that container in the buyer's premises, which brings in all manner of potential problems, insurances, labor laws, liabilities, security, you name it, illegal labor, um, forklifts blowing up because they're not, you know, mechanically worthy, you know, all problems. It's, it's horrible, horrible. Now back to LCs, how do they work? LCs, the, the whole UCP system, UCP 600 is predicated on delivery being on board a vessel at a port of loading. But the D rules, that's irrelevant. The D rules are all about delivery in the destination country. Yep. They're not compatible with letters of credit. What are you yep. going to do? Are you going to have the truck arrive at the buyer's premises? The buyer says, yes, I acknowledge the truck is here. Um, so you have delivered under DAP, but you won't let me open the container until I sign this. You send a copy of it back to your office overseas. They present it to the bank under the LC. It goes to the issuing bank under the LC and the issuing bank um, honors the transaction at the presentation and then hands this silly little piece of paper back to the applicant, the buyer, who two weeks later says to the driver who's starving yeah. to death in the cab of the truck, um, yeah. can I have the goods now, please? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Just, yeah. Okay, so it doesn't it doesn't work also because if if your 
uh, also, if if you as a bank issue a letter of credit and you're thinking you can take collateral uh, by means of a transport document of the goods, well, it doesn't work with the D rules because the buyer normally under under F under the F rules uh, or CPT and CIP, yes, a bit as well. You will have a bill of lading to order of the issuing bank, allowing the issuing bank to endorse this bill of lading to the buyer, but. Who needs a bill of lading with the D rules if it is maritime shipment? It's the seller who needs this because it's the seller who has go and co who is to go and collect the goods at the port of destination and do some unforwarding or what have you to the to the buyer's place. So that is yeah. also one of the reasons but it doesn't work. If it's terminal, then you, if it's a, a delivery at a terminal, you could then say, okay, well, the buyer needs the bill of lading. Yeah. But the buyer is not entitled to that bill of lading because delivery is not going to occur until those goods are made available at the terminal. So are you going to give them the bill of lading early? You could, but is the buyer going to say, yeah, sure. Look, present the bill of lading the moment you ship. Don't worry about the six weeks transit. Yeah. I'll pay for it in advance. Uh, really? Don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to hit a, a Couple of questions there that I'm just seeing in the, the chat. Um, um, I'm happy to to help with the yeah. questions. Yeah, um, perhaps perhaps we can we can go on a bit with the all right, with we'll the we'll F rules. And, yeah. and um, Leo, yeah. if you can keep note of those questions, yeah. please, Nessarol. Yeah. I just saw. Uh, if you want to address uh, one thing that is actually quite um, discussed in the chat. It is how to make FCA work um, with together with an LC. Our friend uh, Nizarul, uh, I think we all know yeah. him very well, um, had uh, posted a comment that says, what if the seller selects its own nominated carrier for FCA shipment at the cost and risk of the buyer with prior agreement and no carrier appointed by the buyer, will this new arrangement in Incoterms 2020 work? And would it give the BL under the uh, LC? Well, the long answer is um, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have never in my whole career seen an FCA shipment ever since FCA came in where the seller has arranged the transport uh, at the cost and risk of the buyer. But apart from that, um, and nevertheless, in FCA, even if the seller were to arrange transport to enter into a contract of carriage, there is no obligation in FCA for when the goods must go on board. Because remember, FCA is an any mode or modes rule. And instead of isolating sea freight by containers from air freight, from rail, from road, and from wheelbarrow and from donkey train, it doesn't. It just encapsulates all modes of transport. And it's one of the shortcomings of the current set of rules. Now, um, how do you make a letter of credit work for FCA in its normal format? You'd need to ideally to ask for a received for shipment bill of lading. But even so, if a container hands the goods over Sorry, if the seller hands the goods over, packed into a container at its premises, it has no knowledge or control of when that container will actually be received by the shipping line, assuming that they're issuing the bill of lading. Um, you can get away with it, but there's no evidence of the seller having delivered in accordance with its contract. And most banks will not, not see a receipt for shipping bill of lading as a collateral either. No, another way is to then make the latest shipment date, say three weeks after the latest delivery date in the contract to allow for time for the container to go on board the mm -hmm. vessel. And even there, I would suggest that the bill of lading should indicate the date of receipt to evidence compliance with the contract of, ca uh, of sale, which is different, of course, to the contract in the LLC. So does that mean that FCA and airway bill wouldn't work either? Um, FCA and an airway bill works because um, under the UCP, 
an airway bill, um, the date of shipment is the date of the issue of the yeah. airway bill. An airway Unless, bill does not have to be uh, proven on board. Uh, yeah, not, there's no yeah. on board. Yeah. Though you can specify in the LC that the airway bill is to show the actual date of flight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, you can, yes, you can, yeah. But, hmm. Yeah, you sometimes you see that yeah. there's been a lot of to, of to, of to do because uh, UCP there was there's a difference between UCP 600 and UCP 500 about that about the actual flight date being mm -hmm. the shipping date. Yeah. Bob, the F rules, FAS, FOB, CFR, yeah. and CIF. What do you think about that and letters of credit? <laughs> Should work, isn't it? CFR and CIF are in fact the only two of the 11 INCO terms rules which, if you can use the expression natively, work with letters of credit. Yep. The seller is the shipper, the beneficiary is the shipper. The seller is in control of the vessel that it's going on and to a great degree when it's going on that vessel, because they would be chartering it, remember these are not for containers, they'd be chartering the vessel and they are in control of the port of loading and the port of discharge. All these wonderful things that appear in the letter of credit. Um, FOB is nearly there. And you, you mentioned this earlier that under um, article, um, what is it, 14K, um, the shipper need not be the beneficiary. However, what happens if you have a letter of credit that requires the bill of lading to be consigned to order and blank endorsed and the shipper is the buyer? Um, what you're going to give them the bill of lading say, Hey guys, can you put your endorsement on this yep. and please give me back the full set of bills of lading so I can present them under your letter of credit? Yep. Uh, no, but in reality, most times, most sellers don't realize what they're getting themselves into by being named as the shipper on a bill of lading, even with FCA, if they're named as the shipper and the buyer fails to take those goods at the other end, the containers are sitting at the port or in the container yard at the destination. Guess who's paying the demurrage and detention the ad nauseum yep. on the, the shipper who is the FCA seller who didn't even know what he was getting into and may not have even seen the bill of lading. Yeah. Nevertheless, you see in most cases, you see uh, bills of lading presented on the letters of credit. You have the seller as the shipper, the beneficiary yeah, as the yeah. shipper, because most people think it should be that way on the letters of credit, which is yeah. not the now case. Now, let me just mention that FAB, CFR, CIF for grain shipments will, in fa uh, will allow containers because they are under GAFTA rules, which exclude not only INCO terms, but the Vienna Convention, the CISG. Yep. So, you know, you will see them, but I have seen so many containers over, uh, uh, so many LCs over the years for grain saying CFR, X number of containers, Inco terms 2010. No, the GAFTA. But the banks have made an assumption that they're Inco terms 2010 just because somebody says CFR. Sure. And FAS, well, there's no onboard bill of lading. There's no need for it. To you be don't on see board. that often with letters of credit. Oh, look, that was nearly dropped. We actually asked yeah. the national yeah. committees, yeah. does anybody use FAS still? And a couple of said, yeah, we think so. Yeah. So we left it in because it's historic. That's what the DDAQ was before 2010. Uh, no, DEQ became, DEQ, um, yeah. Delivered became DAT, which became DPU. Uh, so yeah, FAS... Yeah is just free alongside the ship. It could be used yeah. in certain trades in Europe, for example, where you might barge the, the goods up a, yeah. a canal or a river yeah. to let's say Hamburg. And then the barge would be alongside the ship and either equipment on the barge or that ship would load the goods, which could be, let's say some heavy machinery onto mm -hmm. the special vessel. Yeah, it works in those cases, whether that would be under letter of credit, or mm -hmm. whether there's a need even, and this goes same thing with DPU, whether there's a need to have three letters or you would have, th these would be high value items and you'd have lawyers pouring over these things, putting, you know, everything everywhere and they would detail exactly yeah. what the obligations yeah. of both parties are. Indeed. Thanks, Bob. Um, 
well, we got two, uh, two nice cases to show to you. Can I have the, first, the next slide? Okay. This is, this is based on real examples. We have this letter of credit for the purchase of coal by a Chinese buyer from a South African seller. And that letter of credit requires a presentation of an invoice uh, showing DAP Inco Terms 2020 DAP and Shang People's Republic of China. And an original, a full set of original bills of lading showing the loading port, which is based South Africa, and the discharge port, Dalian. Other documents requested, survey reports at both loading and discharge port. Now, the sales contract, which the bank doesn't know, but which the beneficiary and the buyer do know, requires beneficiary to pay for a loading port survey and an applicant to pay for discharge port survey. Well, what could it be the problems here? Now, how many would you like? Yeah, how many would you like? Indeed, I see already two main problems. Well, in case of uh, in times of risk, it might be that the buyer, the applicant is in a bad shape. He will not pay for the survey at the port of discharge and the beneficiary will not be able to present all documents and will not receive the money. But the main problem is this bill of lading. Who needs this bill of lading to go and collect the goods in the port of Dalian? Not the buyer, but the seller, because the seller delivers the AP. And Shang, the seller needs to collect the goods at the port of Dalian and do some unforwarding in mainland China to Anshang. There's a further problem. That survey report, presumably in the description of goods, there would be certain specifics for that product. And it would be expected that the survey report showed that the product um, agreed with or exceeded those uh, qualifications or those, um, what's the word I'm looking for, but that the specifications. Now, what happens if the survey report at the discharge port, which is before delivery at the place, if that survey report shows the goods failing to comply? The goods are now in the destination country and yet the seller cannot present complying documents. Always the problem when you have the applicant having any sort of control or the applicant's country having any sort of control. Yeah. It makes your letter of credit useless. Yep. There, there or isn't yeah, all dangers. There's a paragraph in the uh, preliminary, preliminary considerations of ISBP about that. Please avoid uh, uh, interventions of applicants. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. A next case. Uh, the next case. Well, this is a real case out of my life as a document checker, which is quite some time ago before the First World War. Well, consider the following transaction. There's a sale of one container of kitchen material, glass, chinaware, utensils, kitchens, equipment, etc., from Hamburg to Casablanca. The buyer in Morocco was a uh, hotel chain that wanted its kitchens to be equipped with that, that new material. FOB Hamburg Inco Terms 2020. Payment by letter of credit with transport document required. Of course, an, an ocean bill of lading, which should be on board. That's always the case. And look what happened. You see a picture there of the container. The container was damaged during an accident with the crane at the container yard at the port of loading. What is exactly the problem here? Oops. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, the container did not go on board the vessel. Nope. Yep. Uh, there is obviously a conflict with using containers with FOB oh. and that's a separate issue to the letter of credit. If the letter of credit foolishly said FOB Hamburg, well, so be it. Look, the simple thing is the goods are, the containers are not going on board the vessel. Therefore, the seller will not receive an onboard bill of lading, yeah. therefore cannot present documents in compliance with the LC, quite apart from any other problems that they can then argue with their insurance companies. The one, one said, well, we, you, you could have solved that problem by not having FOB Hamburg, but by having CIF Casablanca. Will that solve the problem? Because then there's insurance. Nope. Come on. Because, because it won't go on board the vessel. Your containers will not go on board the vessel. You will not get an onboard bill of lading. You will not be able to comply with the LC, even for CIF or CIP. 
Why? Because your insurance only covers from the port of loading to the port. No, no, of I'm vessel. just saying the containers won't be loaded on board the vessel. They're damaged. Okay. That's it. True. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Okay. I think, Leah, we open for more questions. Now, um, what I found interesting uh, in this chat is that next to the um, FCA uh, debate that we, I think, already addressed, there's an interesting debate going on, and it's probably more of a practical side. How can a bank address the problem that somebody is insisting, the client is insisting on an anchor term, that probably will not work with a letter of credit. So what to do then? And we, sorry, of course you could, and it ties a, a little bit in with um, also a- Cut these credit limits. <laughs> it also ties in with a discussion that I wanted to attempt with you guys as well with where do we find proper sources on information of INCO terms? But let's assume you find yourself in a position where the client insists on something that you may or that you may found either completely unsuitable or not entirely ideal. How does one address that and how can we send those people? into you know educating themselves what would you do okay first thing do not look at any charts put out by freight forwarders on the internet i have not seen one of them yet which is 100 percent correct they are all incorrect and or misleading the inco terms rules do not lend themselves to a cut and dried chart as you as i said before these d rules they have so many variations you just can't do it and i had somebody email me yesterday wanting me to endorse their youtube training thing and i said i can't full of mistakes and they had a chart and just because it's somebody's risk they equated that with insurance there is no obligation for insurance except believe it or not in the two rules which have a giveaway they have the i in the middle in other rules, there is no obligation for insurance from either party to the other party. So how do banks educate their clients? Um, the problem we really have, here I'll, I'll be blunt, is that we have two ICC commissions which don't really cooperate. And how far do I go with this? Um, <laughs> Um, when I, when I said to the drafting group members, the other drafting group members, these don't work with letters of credit. It's not how the banks do it. The answer was the banks will have to change. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah. That's what I heard when I was in Paris, the introduction of I in terms 2010, when the yeah. problem with containers uh, and the maritime rules uh, came up and one of the, and, and we said, well, we banks, we need these bills of flating as a collateral. That's the core of trade finance. And the lawyer said, well, banks should stop asking for letters of credit. That's a simple, <laughs> that's a simple answer we got. And this yeah. is still not yeah. solved. Now, Look, coming back yeah. to that as a bank, you could do a few things. First of all, you can try to educate your customers say well if you do this this might be the consequences if you have people on board in your bank that know the inco terms rules very well you could be able to do this the second thing is if you have a, a, a weapon in your hands as a bank as a bank you're issuing a letter of credit and depending on the status of your customer the applicant you might need some collateral well if for example you have a d issue issue you have to issue a letter of credit with a dap inco terms rule and no document or no suitable document at all you might say to tell your customer well i don't have a collateral over the flow of goods in this case so i either refuse to do this or use more of your limits or i have to increase my risk fee for issuing a letter of credit mm. that could be one of the solutions mm. yeah and um there is a, an education tool available to everybody uh, which i do have to push and that's linkedin 
Um, there's the Inco Terms group with over 20,000 members on it, and you're absolutely free to post questions there. You'll probably get an answer from me. And um, the Trade Finance group with over 35,000 rules, and you're very likely to get an answer from me or Hugo. Yep. Sure. Or others, knowledge, other knowledgeable people. Yep. So we're happy on those groups if banks post questions. I mean, we have banks posting questions like, is this a discrepancy? They don't know, they don't know which way they should jump, so they quickly jump on the LinkedIn group and ask for advice of other people. That's fine, that's good. Okay. Oh. Yeah, how can I get into the trade finance groups? Madam Obedi asked for. Well, just go to LinkedIn, search for trade finance, and 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 request uh, request to uh, access to it. And Bob will say yes or no. There's another. May I have an, an, another interesting? I just read documents countersigned by an applicant are neither illegal or immoral. And by the way, quite common in some in, in industries and jurisdictions. There's a question from N. I can only agree with that, but it, if, if it works on the letters of credit, well, they undermine the independent character of a letter of credit. That's what I would say. As a beneficiary, they uh, you, makes your letters of credit useless because you're completely dependent of the goodwill of the applicant. If I, um, I would like to add to the question of the LinkedIn group, and I can see that Don, the legendary Don Smith <laughs> is amongst us, who was mentioned already. Um, there's also, send them uh, the way of ICC national committees, um, have them look at proper sources and also always encourage uh, your clients to join the national committees and support ICC that way, because that is a good way of getting education. And if you do not want to deal with it, you can always send them, uh, you can always say, look, I'm not quite sure if that works, despite knowing better, but why don't you contact your national committee and see what they think? Uh, and there are quite a few national committees out there, such as ICC Austria, that will give you an answer to that. And of course, you could always join our ICC Austria Trade Finance Week because normally it's not um, a virtual uh, conference, but normally we meet in person and then you could meet... It will be a disappointment. All, the, all those legendary um, speakers uh, in person and could ask them the questions. Um, I thought Leo was going to run this every week. <laughs> um, we, we were most certainly, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I think that we will uh, most certainly um, reconsider in how we do, um, um, how we keep our fans and members updated. We were quite overwhelmed uh, and, and, and really, really, really honored to receive the support uh, from around the world that we have received. As with many um, organizations out there and um, many financial institutions, COVID-19 um, all for a sudden there pose a lot of uh, different questions and how are we going to do, deal with things that we would normally handle a little bit differently. Um, and so were we. But we thought for this year, instead of not doing anything at all, uh, we just invite everyone to join in our ICC Austria Trade Finance Week. But we, we still hope that we could all see each other next year in person again. Yeah. Um, as I said, we will monitor the questions and we will also um, ask the speakers to answer some of those questions um, later on. We will put up the upload on the ICC Austria connectivity platform where you already have had the presentation ready for download. With that, I would really, really like to thank the speakers for um, today's incredible webinar. Um, I thought um, it was a blast. Um, I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did so too. Um, for everyone to say goodbye, we will leave um, this presentation open for another minute or two so that you can say goodbye in the chat. Other than that, we will close for today. And some of you, I hopefully, um, welcome tomorrow. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thanks, See everyone. you tomorrow. Yep. Bye. Thanks, bye, everybody. Yep. I could have kept going for another hour, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's only 11.30 p.m. here, so I probably have to go to bed soon. <laughs> okay, well, bye. Sleep well. Sleep well. Thank Bob. you. Bye, everybody. Bye.